wish you were here at my kitchen table this morning enjoying a cup of matcha green tea with me and I might I add a very hot cup of tea because we would have the best time of just digging through God's Word and conversing and I know we did on Tuesday. We had a lot to say and it's so good for the soul to be able to just pour over scripture with other believers. All right, getting started this morning. Last Thursday, we read where Peter told household slaves that they needed to submit themselves to their masters, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the cruel. And then he goes on to describe that, goes on to tell us that this brings favor to God we were called to this just like Christ who knew no sin died for us. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he was suffering, he didn't threaten, but he submitted himself to God. And he is our example of how we are to live and suffer. And it is in this same context then that he now is going to speak to wives here in chapter 3. Let me begin reading here for us. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that even if some disobey the Christian message, they may be won over without a message by the way their wives live when they observe their pure, reverent lives. Now, mm, that is hot. I hope I do not have a ring on this table after this, but okay. Okay. Number one, I've got to take you, remind you, take you back to chapter one, that verse one there when it says this group of people, they were chosen for by the foreknowledge of God and the Father to set them apart by the Spirit for obedience and for the sprinkling of blood. Notice their husbands are not obedient to the message. But by the way their wives, their Christian life, wives are living their life, they might be won over. That's very interesting to me because it's kind of the same concept we see here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, when Peter tells them to conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that in a case where they speak against you as those who do evil, they may be by observing your good works, glorify God in the day of visitation. So in both of these instances, it's not on what's coming out of our mouth, what we're saying that people are won over. It is by our works, our actions, how we are living our lives. Interesting here, verse three. Um, oh, let me give you a verse, Matthew 5, 16. I have it marked so I can just read it quickly. But it says, In the same way, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's kind of along those same lines. Verse 3 then your beauty should not consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold ornaments or fine clothes. Instead, it should consist of the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality. Notice that word imperishable, meaning it can't perish. Um, imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very valuable in God's eyes. And we talked about this on Tuesday, you know, a gentle and quiet spirit. These people seem to be weak and um, just not on top of it, but this is valuable and it does take way more self-control, way more godliness to be quiet and to be gentle than to speak your mind and just tell someone how you really think. So anyway, we, we had fun over that because um, like myself, there's not a lot of gentle, quiet spirits out there, but 
through the Holy Spirit of God in us, we can become more gentle and more quiet because it's very valuable in God's sight. Okay, verse 5. For in the past, the holy women who hoped in God also beautified themselves in this way, submitting to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You have become her children when you do good. There's that when you do good and aren't frightened by anything alarming. Now, this last little statement was is kind of intriguing and a little confusing because um, in the light of the context in which we're reading, we're talking about wives submitting to their husbands, uh, having good works, whether they obey the Christian message or not. They might be won over by our, our lives, that we are to be gentle and quiet. And then it says that we are children of Sarah if we are good and aren't frightened by anything alarming. And that word alarming is terror if we're not frightened by any anything of terror. And so I, I don't know, are we speaking of, you know, we are not to be fearful of our husbands, which is kind of what I think where this is taking us here. Um... I don't know, but it is definitely intriguing here. Verse 7, let's flip this to the husbands here. Husbands, in the same way, to the good and to the cruel, in the same way, live, your, live with your wives with understanding of their weaker nature, yet showing them honor as co-heirs of grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Which tells me that yes, the prayers of husbands can be hindered if they are not honoring their wives. Verse eight. Now finally, all of you should be like-minded and sympathetic. Should love believers. Should love believers. And be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing. So even though someone insults you or does you wrong, you are to bless them in return. Since you were called for this so that you can, so that you can inherit a blessing. Look at verse 10. For the one who wants to love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Remember, deceit is the truth with a little twist to it. That's why it sounds truthful. It's, it's believable because it has a lot of truth in it with a little, with a little lie in there. And we must turn away from evil and do good. There's that turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace, but pursue it, run after it. Um, 12, because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their request, but look, look at this, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. It doesn't say the face of the Lord is against those who are evil, but who do evil. Okay, and this is coming from King David, Psalm 34. And I want to just read this to you in Psalm. I have it marked as always so I can get there quickly to save time. I'm going to begin in verse 11. It says, Come, children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who delights in life, loving a long life to enjoy what is good? Listen, listen. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek 
peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry for help. The face of the Lord is set against those who do what is evil to erase all memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. Okay, so that's Peter was quoting King David there in Psalms here. Okay, verse 13, continuing on. And, though, and who will harm you if you are passionate for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. That is so hard for our minds to grasp. If you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be disturbed. But set apart the Messiah as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Again, same concept without saying a word. But because of your life, people should come and ask you, what is the hope? How are you able to endure and suffer and have such hope within you. How do you do this? You should be able to give a response. Same concept as wives by their good works be able to win over their husbands as well as in here when Peter tells them that their conduct amongst the Gentiles should be good that they should have good works. So when the Gentiles observe their good works, they might glorify God. Do you see this? This has just stuck out to me today uh, in this study because I think we focus so much on, on sharing the gospel. And yes, we should when, when called to it, but here Peter's focus is not on speaking and sharing the gospel, but on our actions and how we're living our life um, to win people to Christ. All right, and he's quoting Isaiah 12 through 13. Let me just, let me read that to you. Isaiah 8 12 through 13. I'm going to begin in, uh, in 11. It says, For this is what the Lord said to me with great power to keep me from going the way of this people. Do not call everything an alliance. These people say it is an alliance. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be terrified. You are to regard only the Lord of hosts as holy. Only he should be feared. Only he should be held in awe. So that you can reference that verse with Isaiah 8, 11 through 13. Verse 16. However, do this with a gentleness and respect. So when they ask you of the hope that is in you because of how you're living your life, do it with respect, do it with gentleness. Keeping your conscience clear so that when you are accused, those who denounce your Christian life will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good than if you should, uh, verse 17, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. And, and we talked about on Tuesday, such the caveat right here. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will for you, than for doing evil. Okay, continuing on in 18. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God after being put to death in the fleshly realm, but made alive in the spiritual realm. Verse 19, 
In that state, he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in the past were disobedient when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while an ark was being prepared. In it, a few, that is eight people, were saved through water. Listen, verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. And listen to his description of what baptism means, what he's describing as baptism here. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God through the re resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now that he has gone into heaven, he is at the God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers subjected to him. Okay, what is being said here? Well, I'm going to take you to a couple verses and see if we can't figure this out. First of all, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. It says this, Now the Messiah has appeared, high priest of the good things that have come, in the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered the Holy of Holies once for all, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who are defiled, sanctified for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without blemish to God, cleanse our consciousness from dead works to serving the living God? Okay, so remember the Jews had to continually sacrifice animals day after day, year after year. And so their sin was always before them as a remembrance because they had to sacrifice animals because of it. Now that Christ has died by his own blood, we are saved by, we are forgiven and saved from our sins through Christ Jesus. We can have a clear conscience because our, our sin is forgiven once and for all. So that is a good conscience, a clear conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me take you to Ephesians 1.21. Ephesians 1.21. Um, let me let me read up here in verse 20. He demonstrated this power in the Messiah by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion, and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Uh, moving then to 612, just slip over a page with me to chapter 6, verse 12. It says, For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. This is why you must take up the full armor of God so that you may, able, so that you may be able to resist the devil, or so that, let me read this again for you, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything so to take your stand. All right. So, so we get this. So what is really being said here? Well, I do believe next week, we will understand this even better because I think we have to go back to what Jesus taught Peter and specifically Peter and three other disciples about the end of the age to really understand where Peter is coming from. And we're going to do that next week. But just to, to not get ahead of ourselves, I believe Peter is, is encouraging this group of people. He is saying, 
Yes, he's, he's telling them what has already happened. Yes, the message was preached, the gospel was preached before those 120 years before the flood. But God only saved eight. And yes, those eight were saved through the water. And it's the same concept with you, he's saying. You're going to be saved through the judgment by your baptism, which is not just not the fleshly being just dipped in water. No, it's with your clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By your salvation, you too will be saved. And so I think that is the message that's being portrayed here because we got to keep it in context of what he's been telling us. And even when we get to verse 4, it begins, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves. So like I said, next week in chapter 4, as we dig into this a little deeper, I think these verses here will become even clearer as to what Peter is saying. So you will have to tune in and you'll have to meet me back here at my kitchen table next Thursday. I hope to see you here.